I'm afraid I've got some bad news. I knew it. I love when he does that. There's an incredible tag match scheduled for next week. Because Officer Bar Brady was back in the back with the middle-aged Bucks doing a promo about next week they're going to take on TH2. Oh, joy. Can you imagine the mess from those four trampoline gymnasts? But the Bucks do the promo. They're trying to sound intimidating, which is a lost cause, but they, you know, they think they are. And suddenly the acclaimed, the team of the acclaimed come in. Have I ever seen the acclaimed on this television program before? I've never seen the acclaimed before. I heard from someone that apparently they've been on maybe the uh, YouTube show, but we've never, we've never seen them at all that I can, I don't, I, I would remember. We've never seen them on the show. Okay. No. So they come just walk in and one of them recites a poem about the bucks looking at each other's cocks on the cover of their book, making fun of that. Which, okay, that'd have been fine. But then here comes TH2 and attack the Bucks and tossed one, tossed one of them in a fucking production box, equipment case. Can this be any phonier looking? Not only that the Bucks are doing the promo when these other two guys come in and interrupt, that happens all the time. But then the, they got to put a hat on a hat and here comes the other team and jumps them. Everybody gets jumped in the back in every backstage segment this is ridiculous can they make it any phonier any more obvious any more well this is what you're supposed to do to promote this match type of thing from somebody who sits on the internet and dreams of becoming a booker and has a fantasy federation and somehow gets enough money to be able to do oh i forgot okay the bucks are so bad on the mic and nick jackson he rarely speaks, and when he does, you understand why he rarely speaks. <laughs> he is just a dimwit. And then Matt Jackson is just one of the most preposterous characters in wrestling because he tries to act like he's a tough guy. The other guys come out, and they bow up like they're going to do something. Have you guys looked in a mirror? You don't intimidate anyone. And as far as the acclaimed going, the guy wasn't a poem. I believe it was actually freestyle rapping like Cena used to do. And... I think it was, what, two weeks ago where the Bucks announced that Top Flight had requested a match, and now they were being brought in, and then AEW signed them. Now another team we've never seen before all of a sudden shows up and wants the Bucks. And then TH2, who they've done nothing with for months, I don't know if that was because of the COVID-19 restrictions on who can get in here and who couldn't, but all of a sudden they're in the mix. I said it before, a uh, NXT's tag team division is just a joke. AEW's tag team division is a complete mess. Meanwhile, FTR, oh, the FTR way, the way, is sitting there and doing nothing. I was about, where where FTR was not on this show? No. They have 15 tag teams straight out of indie wrestling that none of them are worth a shit, and they've got the best in-ring tag team in the world, and they don't even put them on the show. Okay. And I the did next... like the fact the Acclaim brought up that something that we've talked about here on the show how ridiculous the Young Bucks book cover is. Why would that be the picture they chose, them looking at each other's dicks? Because I guarantee you, because they're Christian and they probably have only been laid once in their life by their significant other, they weren't thinking. They didn't have cock on their mind when they were looking at that cover. Like everybody else would look, why are they looking at each other's dicks? They probably thought, well, they, they, we look like we're praying. I don't fucking know with these nerds.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 235 of the Hoots Podcast. Hope you guys are having a wonderful week. It is yours truly, the nefarious brother Adam, uh, recording this on a Thursday. It's December 10th, 2020. Uh, we're tw- 20 plus days out from ending this uh, hellhole of a year. There's so many things to talk about on this week's podcast. Uh, Got to recap NC TakeOver War Games uh, from this past Sunday night at the Capitol Wrestling Center in Orlando, Florida. Also got to uh, mention we got a couple big slates of shows coming up this weekend. Uh, we got um, the New Japan Best of Super Juniors World Tag League Finals that's taking place tomorrow. And also New Japan's uh, presenting the Super J Cup on Saturday. And then um, also be making predictions for Impact's final pay-per-view event of the year called Final Resolution on Saturday as well. So a lot of busy end uh, pay-per-views coming up this weekend. And as always, you can check out those transcripts at ProWrestlingTranscriptions.com. But for those who are listening to the podcast for the first time, thank you for the support. It really means a lot to me. Appreciate you uh, taking a chance at this podcast. Uh, my name is Josh Lopez. You can follow me at Twitter at the Who's Podcast. I'm also on Instagram at Joshy Lopez94. That's J-O-S-H-I-E Lopez94. And um, of course, we got. Uh, I'm not alone this week. As always, we always got um, submissions from the uh, one and only brother Carter, Derek Stoughton. Uh You can follow me at Twitter at Derek06. Derek will be um, hitting us up with this week's edition of the Thoughts of Derek Hope. And of course. Everybody's favorite segment in podcasting in 2020. What the hell is wrong with AEW? Believe it or not, folks, there are people on Twitter that act like AEW does nothing wrong. And (laughs) on Who's Podcast, we like to dispel that notion. And uh, this is not a Teflon AEW uh, product here. But, um, yeah, we just got a lot of stuff to get to. And uh, I wanted to mention... um, the show comes to you free of charge every single Thursday on Apple Podcasts, so make sure to just subscribe so you never miss an episode. And um, bookmark com. And especially for those who use Apple Podcasts, if you could leave us a four- or five-star review, it really helps expand the reach of the show. And I want to get your guys' thoughts on the podcast positively or negatively. I just want to get some feedback for you guys, so I appreciate the support. Uh, right now, we're going to get into the Good Brother Q&A session. As always, you can send me a question at thehootspodcast at gmail.com or on Twitter at thehootspodcast. And we're going to start off with our uh, regular questions and um, submissions from the Good Brothers, and especially this first one here from Chris Zuleta. By the way, you can follow me on Twitter at xteamzuleta 24 x on the Twitters. He says... Uh, first question, what's up, Oos? Here's some questions for this week. Who will win the NFC East? Man. <laughs> I don't remember a time where a, a division in sports meant less than the NFC East right now. And I'm not just talking about just the season, but in general. It's, I, 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 this is something I'm going to remember for the rest of my life where, like, you just think about odd things with sports, but there's always been one constant that the NFC East is just a shit show. <laughs> uh, you never know who's going to win. Um, it, it's just, it's embarrassing. Um, you know what, Chris, I'll go with the Washington football team. That'll be my pick for the NFC East. I like that question, though. Like, and the fact that the NFC East still gets a chance to play in the playoffs is just embarrassing. Um, who will win the college football national championship this year? Um, I'm so out of loop with college football, man. I'm sorry. I have no idea who, who where, who's who. Um, I'll probably say Alabama again or Ohio State. I'm not sure. Um, what else is there for Johnny Gargano to do in NXT? Well... I don't remember Johnny having that much of an extensive extensive role title run on NXT. Um, Right now, he's the current North American champion, and he's really doing a good job with his um, uh, run uh, as a heel. Now, he got the Johnny Gargan away, and he's being more and more obnoxious as the weeks go by. I didn't know he was such a big... David Arquette fans, so that one really surprised me. But um, I think that 
when it comes to Johnny, there's I'm sure there's a lot of stuff to do, and there's always new superstars uh, circling through the performance center that Johnny can have feuds with. And I think it's pretty common knowledge that guys like him and Champer would prefer just wrestling and um, at the Capitol Wrestling Center as opposed to going up to Raw or SmackDown. Um, I, I don't know why they wouldn't want to be part of that brand, but um, yeah, I, I think there's some left to do with Johnny Gargano, and I, I don't remember Johnny Gargano ever having a feud with Finn Balor, so that'd be something I'd be on the lookout for towards the future. Will Champa get another NXT title run? Um, possibly. It just depends where he goes from here. Right now, he's in the mid card. Uh, again, like I mentioned with Johnny, he's just one of those guys that's just more content with being in NXT. So, um, with that being the case, I, I definitely can see another scenario where Ta- Tommaso Champa has another NXT title run before he retires. So. Um, when do you think we get Roman versus Goldberg? Uh, I'd probably say the Royal Rumble, um, since they keep hyping this up. Um, it'd just it'd be, a make, be a makeup for last year's WrestleMania for the fact that it happened. And, um, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of people just going on soliloquies and just whining and bitching about having a Roman and Goldberg match. Folks, you know, I, I <laughs> it shouldn't take me to say this, that just because you particularly don't like a per, a performer or you don't like a matchup, that doesn't mean you have to speak for all of us wrestling fans. Like, I do a wrestling podcast here, but in no way or any fashion or any form would I ever come on here and act like I'm above all of you as wrestling fans or my opinion carries more weight than your guys' opinions because that's not true. I don't speak for all of you guys. I don't. I speak for myself, and I think that's the charm of this podcast is that we could speak for ourselves, whether you agree or disagree with what I have to say on wrestling or the fact that I don't think AEW is the greatest wrestling promotion since sliced bread. Uh, you know, <laughs> one thing that comes with this show, I'll just speak for myself, and um, yeah, okay, maybe you in particular don't want to see Goldberg versus Roman Reigns, but that does not mean other people don't want to see it. I I really think that's a big issue with our f- fan community where we try to speak and generalize things for other people without letting people think for themselves. So um, I, I'd probably say the Royal Rumble is when uh, Goldberg will fight Roman Reigns. Do I want to see it personally? No, but... Uh, Again, I can't speak for other people. If there's other people that want to watch that match, let them do it. <laughs> I, I, that, that's the thing. Like People are marking out and want to see seeing in wrestling matches. I don't give a shit what he does because he's not going to do anything consequential there. But I'm not going to come on here and r- ruin that for all you guys. Like, it is what it is. Any pay-per-views do you go back and watch multiple times? Uh, I think it's probably the pay-per-views that I went and attended in person, more uh, to be honest with you, Chris. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's past four Rumbles or WrestleManias I would watch throughout the calendar year. I, I would do that. But um, I think for me, I, I always go back to watch the shows that I went to, especially like Money in the Bank 2011. I think I've watched that show like 15 or 20 times. Um a couple of the payback shows I went to. Uh, WrestleMania 22 is still my favorite WrestleMania of all time. Uh, WrestleMania 31, I, w- I was fortunate to be there and cover the event uh, in Santa Clara. And then um, R- WrestleMania 33 and 34 are ones I haven't had a chance to watch recently, but I do want to watch those again down the road. But uh, that's a good question. Um, do you think we'll see Victoria re- return to wrestling? And does she belong in the WWE Hall of Fame? I I would hope so that she would come back to wrestling, but if she's fully retired, I do think she belongs in the WWE Hall of Fame. And this is a little more personal for me because I know Lisa uh, Marie Vron. Um, she had a restaurant here in Chicago called the, the Square Circle, um, and I got to meet her at a bunch of different occasions and at, at different independent events. She's a sweet person, and uh, her career is very underrated and underappreciated by this generation of wrestling fans for what she did, not only as a wrestler, but character-wise. Um, she definitely belongs in the WWE Hall of Fame, because as much as we can put Trish Stratus and Lita and all these other people on a pedestal, we could also say that Victoria is just right there with the rest of them. So uh, I think that 
Victoria does belong in the WWE Hall of Fame, and I hope that will happen one day. Do you think Gallows and Anderson will join Omega and Callis? Um, I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> like having the entire Bullet Club come back together as it originally was does nothing for me. Like, I know their impact with merchandise and internet fan culture, and I respect all of that, but when I hear this hoopla and this this talk about, oh my god, we're going to have the full Bullet Club back, we're going to have Omega and the Bucks back with Tamatanga and G.O.D., Bad Luck Folly, and uh, Finn, I heard somebody say, oh, Finn Balor's contract's coming back, so Prince Devs, uh, oh, of course he's coming back uh, to the Bullet Club. Like, for me, I don't really care if the full Bullet Club comes back, and I really don't. So do I think Gallus and Anderson need to join Omega Cows? I'm not sure, because when they came into Impact, they were all about being baby faces and capitalizing on the buzzer game from their fans with talking shops. So, yeah, of course, uh, Bull Club probably come before anything with those guys, but even then, like, Omega and Kallus are just a fine duo if this is what it's going to be. I'd rather have it be like this because Doc Kallus is good on the microphone, and I like what he's done so far. But, again, as I'll mention later on in the podcast this week when we do this AEW segment, I just I can't buy into what Kenny Omega's doing. I just can't, and I'll, I'll explain why later. Where would you like to see Mike Tanay doing commentary? Um, good question. Uh, I'd like to see Mike Tanay replace his caliber on AEW. I like that question, though. Who wins in Keisha Cole versus Ashanti battle on Saturday? Oh, boy. <laughs> Those two are doing a battle? Man. <laughs> Damn, that, that that's got to be, like, split in the middle right there for me. Like, um... Because I, I, lo- I love both of them. Uh, they're both very talented singers, and that's a big part of my childhood is uh, Keisha Cole and Ashanti. So I would say more than likely, I, fuck, man, they both have equal amount of hits, so this is really hard. So I'd probably say that Keisha Cole will win this one, uh, to be honest with you. I think Keisha Cole will probably win this um, versus battle. I just think she has better hits than Ashanti, but it's very, very close to... Um, it, it's like... I'm not... I'm <laughs> yeah, it's like a lose-lose situation. You know, if you're going to have Keisha Cole and Ashanti, let's just add Faith Evans in it as well. Let's make it a triple threat match, pal. <laughs> so... Um, I'm looking forward to watching it. It should be uh, it should be very entertaining. But if I had to pick one who wins, I'd probably say Keisha Cole. Uh, shout out to Brett Carter who's watching this uh, little session here on Facebook. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chris, for the questions this week, though. I really appreciate it, brother. Um, okay, so we're going to transition to the next batch of questions here. And um, as always, you guys can send me questions on Twitter or at uh, the Who's Podcast at gmail.com. Um, like I said, uh, for those who don't know, listen to the audio version right now. I'm actually recording this Good Brothers Q&A session on Facebook. And this is something that I like to do going forward in the coming weeks. So I appreciate those who are watching this video right now on Facebook. All right. The last set of questions here is from the Good Brother Nate the Great. You can follow him at Twitter at Cycle Nagiri. Uh, first question, what would you do with Keith Lee come WrestleMania? Uh, for me, i like to see Keith Lee versus Bobby Lashley for the United States Championship at WrestleMania. There you go, pal. Here we go. Is Chicago pizza as good as advertised? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Well, there's one thing I'll tell you that it's not. It's not overrated. I'll tell you that first off. Um, <laughs> Chicago pizza is tremendous. It's definitely better than New York pizza. It's 
it's a hundred times better than Boston pizza. I had that a couple times when I was uh, doing uh, jazz festivals out there. <laughs> uh, no, Chicago pizza is, is even better than advertised. How about that, pal? Uh, I, I love Chicago pizza. It's, it's fucking awesome. Um, especially the the stuffed pizza or deep dish pizza, whatever you want to call it. Um, those are the best. Um, <laughs> I like that question, though, Nate. What was one thing you'd like to see happen in 21? Whether it be a career move, Bears off-season move, or something in wrestling? Uh, I like this one. It'd be like a three-parter here. Um, well, first of all, I think for me, uh, as far as like a career move, I'd like to see... Uh, it's probably take my step in that door of the radio field and actually be a board op and a producer and just work in that field. Uh, that'd be something I would want to do. Um, I've been taught about it for years. I still have the skills. I went to school for this. So career move for me personally and professionally, I, I just want to start working at a sports radio station. That's what I really want. And then, um, something in wrestling, it, this is a far cry, but I, I just want to get back to us enjoying wrestling for the wrestling and stop acting like we're experts in a field that we've never worked in before, you know? That's what I really want. But, again, that's a systemic issue with this culture that we're in right now where um, we just take we take the business for granted. We really do. You know, it's, like we cast... Our passion, we, we use passion as a window dressing to act snarky and just be bitter about today's wrestling. And I, that's not why I got into wrestling in the first place. I love wrestling. This is my escape for me. And I just feel like a lot of times we take it for granted more times than we should. So, but if there's something wrestling, wrestling related, um, I would really hope that New Japan is able to pull off a show at MSG in 2021. That'd be something that I would really like to see because one, I've never been to New York before, and two, I've never been to a New Japan show before. So I want to. It's like a little double whammy thing. You're like, yo, you go to New York for a couple days, bam, you get to go see a New Japan show at MSG. I I would love that. So. That's a good question, though. I really like those. And the best question this week, um, and it's very a topic that we haven't really talked about a lot here on the Hoops Podcast recently. Um, here's the last question for Nate. He says, what advice would you give someone dealing with depression? Well, as somebody who does deal with depression, I would just say there, there's levels to this, obviously, right? And... For me, like, I'll share a couple stories with you guys. Like, there's been times where I've been at rock bottom internally, and I thought there's no other purpose to be here, right? And there's always the alternative, and, you know, I I think it's really ignorant at times for people to try to justify or blame people that go that alternative route, and you guys know what the alternative route I'm talking about, but... That that's their story. Something pushed them to that point. So I I have sympathy for people when they do go that route. And I I just think with depression, it, it's it's very fluid to wherever the situation you're in. And I think just in general, like I I would just tell somebody like, no matter what's going on in your life, you need to really take a step back. And ask yourself, what are you going to do to push yourself out of this hole? Because I think so much of our issues today is the fact that we're so rooted in what we were raised up in. That we're not able to have the ability to look ourselves in the mirror and try to live our own lives. And try try to get some independence. Try to form your own identity. We don't have a good relationship with ourselves because we're so succumb, we're so uh, just brought down by you know, family traditions, and this is how you're supposed to live your life, and how you're supposed to do this, and how you're supposed to do that, that we don't really take the time to really 
find out who we are and what we want to do. And there's a lot of uh, things that come to your life that's unfair. There's things that come out of your, come out of the blue and decisions that are out of your control. And I just think when it comes to depression, um, you know, it's it's an unfair game, but it's a battle that we all have to deal with. And I think it, I think some of us handle it better than others. But also at the same time, it's something that just doesn't magically go away. And it's not something that you can scoff at either. People deal with depression. People deal with deep depression. Uh, there's clinical depression. Uh, depression and mental health is something that I don't think people put enough spotlight on. And when me and Adam Daly were doing the podcast together and we're talking about mental health almost every week, like, I, I love that time of the podcast because it was very important because we're having real dialogue and we're having real conversations. And if you're dealing with depression, I want you to understand that you are the best person in your life and nobody else. You have everything within you to do whatever the fuck you want to do in your life, all right? that That's the first advice right there. You have to remind yourself every day that you are the best in the world at what you do, and there's nothing anybody can put a ceiling above you. You have to do what's best for you. And are there days you're overwhelmed? Are there days you start questioning yourself? Are there days you wonder why why am I not getting the things that I want? Why am I feeling sorry for myself? Why why do I feel like everybody's out to get me? Are, are, do you have insecurities? It's okay to have those. It's okay to be a human being. It, it's natural. We're not all perfect. But even if you're dealing with depression. You have to know what you are internally to push yourself forward into what you want to do and find that internal happiness. Because if you're not strong internally, you're just going down a bad rabbit hole. You're going down a path that's going to be destructive. It's going to be really hard for you to find some levity in whatever battle you're going through because you're not taking the time to really... Have that relationship with yourself. Like, folks, like, I'm a really shy, quiet person when I'm off this mic. Like, this is therapy for me. This is my platform to release. This is my uh, platform to be myself and have fun and try to make you guys laugh, try to give you guys some life lessons and make this a positive experience for you guys. But if you're dealing with depression and you're not talking to people and you're not if you're expecting handouts and having people to feel sorry for you, that's just not going to work. Like, we all have depression, but you have to open up. You have to push yourself through that bad energy because if you're not into your energy, everything surrounding you is just going to overwhelm you. You're going to start questioning yourself. You're going to start making decisions that's wrong for you. And you're going to try to do everything just to fit with everybody else instead of What's more important, you have to form your own identity. And I think that's very important in life. You've got to form your own identity. And it's not to say that you don't love your family, that you don't respect traditions or anything like that. But if you don't have yourself, what do you have? Like, we all have, succumb to, oh, we just got family, but is that really the case all the time? We have family members that beef with each other. We got families that do this and that with each other. Like, yeah, we have blood, but do you really have that care? Do you really have that relationship with somebody in your family? Let's, let's be honest. Let's be real here, guys. Like, if you don't have yourself, and I'm not saying this, oh, you have to be selfish, you have to be ignorant, you have to be oblivious to other people around you. I'm not saying that. But if you don't have yourself, what do you really have? And that's my question for you guys. Like, especially for those who deal with depression, because you have the power to pull yourself out of depression. I helped somebody recover from drugs. I fell in love with that person during the process. And she spit back in my face. You know, like, that happened. And I'm not afraid to admit it. You know, that there, there's just bad people out there. And did I get in a rut last year? You're damn right. <laughs> uh, and it's stuff that I still think about every day. And, you know, you, you learn something new every day. 
And that, that's the part of life. You learn something new. You try to grow. You try to be a better person no matter what you're going through in life. And I want to see you guys just take the time to figure out who you are. Because if you don't have yourself, you don't have anything. And that's the main advice I would give for anybody to deal with depression because that's the thing. <laughs> it, it's, it's a battle that people like to choose to ignore. Because people are just so very narrow-minded in the way they go about their life. But, um, Nate, I'm, great, I, I'm grateful you said that question, man. I loved it. Thank you so much, brother. All right, folks. Uh, that's going to be a wrap-up for this week's edition of the Good Brothers Q&A session. As always, if you ever want to send your boy a question, all you have to do is to hit me up on Twitter at the Hoots Podcast or send me a question at the Hoots Podcast at gmail.com. With that being said, we're going to take our first break here on the Who's Podcast. And when we come back, I'm going to be recapping what happened this week in WWE. We'll be right back in a couple minutes. Back here in the Who's Podcast, it's time to recap what happened this week in WWE. Uh, a lot of stuff to get to uh, this week. And new addition that I'm going to be starting doing on the podcast each week is giving you some of my thoughts on some of the ancillary programs for WWE, uh, especially NXT UK and 205 Live and um, the regular NXT that you see on USA Network. I think it's very important to add those thoughts into the conversation because I do cover those shows on ProWrestlingTransfers.com. And I, there's, good, uh, there's good matches that our people don't talk about on these shows, and I like to uh, shed some spotlight on that. So... With that being said, start off with here. If you look at NXT UK, and I, I love what that brand represents. It's my, if you ask me, honestly, it's my personal favorite WWE brand going on right now. It has my style of wrestling, and it's just a lot of fun to watch. Especially if you look at last week's episode, where you had two just barnstormers of the main events. We had Alexander Wolf and Joe Coffey, which was just a slugfest. Uh, Joe Coffey did defeat Alexander Wolf, which was a really good match. And then you look at the main event, it was the hunt against uh, Mark Andrews and Flash Morgan Webster. That match is a lot of fun to jot down as well. Uh, honestly, guys, you really need to go check out NXT UK. Uh, it has a tremendous roster, especially... Eddie Dennis, that's a shout out for you, uh, John the Hood. <laughs> uh, of course, we got our other favorites like Noam Dar and Jordan Devlin, the real NXT Cruiserweight Champion. You got the Ring General Walter in NXT UK. And I love what I'm seeing from Rampage, Rampage Brown. Uh, that dude is pretty impressive to say the least. So, NXT UK. Comes out every Thursday, just like this podcast, by the way. Um, I love that show. It's my favorite wrestling show of the week. So uh, I love NXT UK. And then we go into, like, uh, what happened on 205 Live this week. Um, Kurt Stallion. I, got, I, want, I want to talk about him a little bit because I think I only covered one match of his uh, before he signed with WWE. And it was that Evolve WWE special that went out in last June to be, if, if I'm not mistaken. It was right before Extreme Rules. And they had this whole special at the ECW arena, and Paul Heyman came out, and and I watched Kurt Stallion for the first time. I was like, man, this dude's pretty impressive for a wrestler his size, you know? And now he looks more like Ryan Gosling, which is, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, <laughs> but as far as a wrestler, like, that dude is really, really talented. Right now, he's the number one contender for the NXT Cruiserweight Championship, and, um... I I love what he does in the ring. <laughs> He's fucking awesome. He had a really good match with Ario Tavari. You can also see the Bollywood Boys against Everrise. I gotta tell you this. Everrise rules, too. I gotta say that. Those guys are entertaining. Like, anytime you hear them win a match or they're... Uh, they lose the match. They just go on these freaking promos and conspiracy theories. Like they're they're you're they're your tr traditional heel tag team, all right? And they're very good at it. Like I I crack up every time I listen to them. Uh, do problems like listen to this one from last night from XT.
Damn right, Ever Rise rules. <laughs> you know who else rules? Their uh, their uh, opponents in the Triple Threat match of Last X XC uh, on USA Network. The grizzled young veterans. Here we go. Grizzled young veterans, you guys were successful in Triple Threat action tonight. What message did you conquered all of Europe, and we're never gonna stop. We have been on the sidelines for far too long. We are not here to waste any time. Tonight, we took out two top contenders at the same time. James Drake, Liverpool's number one, Zach Gibson. The grizzled young veterans, soon to be recognised as NXT's number one. Go on, interview. God, man. <laughs> You know, as much as I love MGF and how good he is as a promo, nobody can touch heat when it comes to promos as Zach gets it, man. Liverpool's number one. <laughs> God, I love that tag team. You know, since we're talking about NXT, right? I might as well get into this War Games review. I liked the show on, um, on Sunday night. I really did. You know, here the, the Black Sabbath song was fun. You know, the War Pig song, that song was a lot of fun to listen to. Um, I guess we should start off first with uh, my thoughts on the triple threat match with Leon Ruff, Damian Priest, and Johnny Gargano. Uh, I I thought it was a really nice match. I like the match layouts. I got to say, man, the, I think NXT has the best referee crew in the entire wrestling business. I, I think it's... The NXT and NXT UK referee crews are just the best, in my opinion. Um, the match layouts for the matches this week were just, um, especially the pay per view was just really good, especially this match. Um, you know, everybody played their role right. I, I keep telling you guys that Daniel Priest is box office, that dude's the, the next big thing. And Johnny Gargano being the Weasley heel. Um, I, I found it interesting that. Johnny wore Cleveland Browns gear when he won a title. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good omen or a bad omen for the Browns with their current record right now in the NFL, but uh, <laughs> I thought that was very interesting. And then this whole stuff with the screen thing, like, I, I I think it's funny for heel persons, but I still don't get it. <laughs> I, I really don't. I don't know why he's so obsessed with ghost faces. Like, it's, it's, it's weird. <laughs> Uh, but it ended up being that Austin Theory uh, was behind the Ghost Mask and cost David Priest to match. And uh, Austin Theory has joined the Gargano way, if you will, pal. So it's Johnny, Candice, Indy Hartwell, and Austin Theory as a group in NXT. I, I liked some of the strap match with Dexter Loomis and Cameron Grimes. Uh, I thought the match was a little longer than it needed it to. But uh, Dex Loomis did to be Cameron Grimes going to the moon. <laughs> that guy's a trip. Uh, but yeah, Dex Loomis got the win. I wasn't really surprised by that. And then one of my favorite matches from War Games this weekend was uh, Tommaso Ciampa against Timothy Thatcher. My God, what a match. These two beat the ever loving shit out of each other. <laughs> Palm strikes, forearm exchanges. You know, my style of wrestling. Like, I was like, damn, is Ishii out there? Is Suzuki out there? <laughs> that was a great match. <laughs> if you guys haven't watched it, uh, even without the War Games match, like, I, this one almost stole the show for me because I love that match so much, so much. So, Timothy Thatcher and Tommaso Ciampa, you get uh, two thumbs up from your boy. Uh, that match was fantastic. And then, when it comes to the two War Games matches, I gotta mention this really quick. Brian Alvarez... 
is by far the worst analyst in any form of media I've ever heard in my entire life. And I'm just throwing that out there right now. I don't care if you get offended by that. Whatever the situation is, Brian Alvarez just absolutely sucks. Okay? Just... I'm not even going to get started with him right now. Uh, let's talk about the women's war games match. So I, I had the right pr- predictor. I did have a feeling that Team Canis would be Team Shotzi. Uh, end up being a good decision. We're having Raquel Gonzalez uh, beat Io Shirai, so she has a future NXT Women's Tile shot in her future. I, you know, I like I saw people complain. Oh, what is this bitch having the baby faces have the advantage? Well, if you're gonna do two War Games matches, why would heels have the advantage in both matches? And if you look at the match layout. King Team Candice actually did have the advantage because, he, like, I'm hearing Brian Alvarez whine about, oh, the booking, this women's war game match, didn't know it makes sense. Okay, Team Shotzi had a team advantage, but Candice Ray, being the smart one in the women's locker room, told her team, like the good general she is, that, hey, even though we have the advantage, we're going to do everything we can to keep Eel Sarai off off, out of the structure. So tell me how that doesn't make sense. Like, all these times, every single week, I've seen these threads of whining and bitching about things don't make sense here and things don't make sense there. Guys, we're talking the premise of what we're watching and covering every week doesn't make sense. We got two people, we got two people or two ladies in oil, in wrestling gear, ha- having a choreographed, predetermined match. The premise, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> That's the charm of wrestling, that it doesn't make sense. And th- to say, oh, it doesn't make sense for uh, uh, the, fa- the faces to have the advantage. Were you watching the match? Like... <laughs> That dude grasps for so many straws, it's absolutely insane. The things he complains about, yet he marks out for for AEW, is just mind-blowing to me. The double stares that dude has on his shows every single week. It's just, it's amazing. Uh, the Mets working match. Uh, Undisputed Era gets uh, Team McAfee. Uh, I, I, I like the match. I think for me, I preferred the women's war games match to the men's one. If you if you're gonna ask me, um, uh, not that the men's one wasn't bad. I just thought they didn't need to go almost 50 minutes. <laughs> that that was a lot of match. Um, but yeah, Team uh, Undisputed Era did defeat Team McAfee. Pat McAfee has all the respect in the world for me, man. Like that guy busts his ass in that match. The guy really did his best. Uh, just given the circumstances with him not being a full-time professional wrestler, what he does is it's just phenomenal, man. Like, uh, I, I don't know how you don't have respect for Pat McAfee after the last few matches he just had. Like, like it's okay to not like him as a person or whatever, but like him as a performer is just absolutely insane. He's 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 the man. <laughs> you know that you got you got to look at a guy like Pat McAfee and be like inspired by what he does uh, and how he made a career for himself outside of football like that is just very impressive, man. He he has a very impressive story, and the, the best part about it is that Pat McAfee is a fan. He's one of us. <laughs> And it's cool to see what he's doing out there, and he's doing a great job. So, um, salute to everybody that put their body in the line in that war game structure. There were some really nasty spots in both of the matches on Sunday, and I just want to give a tip of cap to all of them. Uh, both the men and the ladies, they freaking killed it. So, overall, I, I enjoyed the war game show. Obviously, it's a different feel without having fans there. So, you know. Maybe that loses some luster, but I think overall, I thought this takeover was pretty solid from top to bottom. Was this the best takeover ever? Probably not, but uh, this one is still another good one and definitely one I recommend for you guys if you guys haven't seen it yet. And then, really quick, uh, before we get to our next part of the podcast, I do want to mention some of the stuff that's going on with Raw and SmackDown this week. And... Um, 
talk about the tribal chief of pro wrestling, uh, Roman Reigns. Uh, he's about to have an, uh, a TLC match with Kevin Owens for the Universal Championship. Uh, Roman Reigns got himself uh, disqualified uh, in the tag team main event on SmackDown last Friday night. Um, and he's really putting the beat down on Kevin Owens and Jey Uso. And it's like, once the weeks go by, the more and more unhinged Roman Reigns gets. And for me, honestly, I think I've had my fill of main event Jay Uso, and it's not a dig towards Jay because I like him as a prefer, uh, as a person and as a performer. He's a great wrestler, but for me, I don't think he needs to be in the main event of every single show. But I get why he's there. I I get the whole storyline. Trust me, <laughs> nobody loves the travel chief of pro wrestling more than I do. All right, like the guy is fucking awesome. Um, and I'm really excited for him and my guy KL to have their match at TLC. I think that's gonna be a barnstormer. I think that'll be fine, um, but I don't think I don't think I need to see Jay Uso in the main event every single week. Um, our stuff and standouts for me, like I thought, this was like a solid week as far as like building up the matches for TLC. Uh, I thought Raw was a better show this week than SmackDown. If you guys want to get my thoughts on that really quick, um, I just thought there was a lot of good matches with Monday Night Raw this week. Uh, you know, we had. Uh, Xavier, no, you had Kofi Kingston and Cedric Alexander and Kofi and Shelton Benjamin. I thought those matches were good. Um, of course, you had uh, Sheamus and Drew McIntyre against The Miz, AJ Styles, and John Morrison. That three-on-two three, three on two handicap match I thought was great. Um, you know, seeing McIntyre and Sheamus had that brawl at the backstage area was pretty funny because I, I think – you know, the thing with those two guys, like, you could believe that would happen. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this happened in uh, when they're in the uh, Indies with each other in the UK. Like, <laughs> like it, this is slow bird getting to this Max Tyron Shades feud, and I, I don't have a problem with that. But uh, those two are going to have some good matches with each other whenever they do have their rivalry with each other. So, so far, so good with the Shades and Max stuff. Um I, I'll be consistent with this. I, I haven't been enjoying anything from uh, Nia Jax. It started to hinder itself with Shayna Baszler. It's like, like I was trying to join the match with Asuka and Shayna, but it's like Nia just drags everything down. But, you know, when it comes to whose podcast, we're trying to find some levity in some of this stuff. So, <laughs> Lana, let's give a round of applause to Lana really quick, man. Not only for having the bravery and courage that she has, and the passion, you can see how much she wants it. And I think that's something that's us wrestling fans should appreciate. The fact that she does care and she wants to be really good at this. And um, getting better as the weeks go by in the ring as, as well. And we found out that Asuka and Lana will be taking on Daya and Shayna for the tag titles at TLC. So that, that, that should be an interesting match. I really do hope that Nia and Shayna lose the tag titles because... Nia Jax is just the worst. I'm sorry, guys. I don't want to be too harsh here, but God, man, she's brutal. <laughs> she is brutal. Um, Speaking of stuff that wasn't brutal, though, uh, Bobby Lashley and Jeff Hardy, I, I really, really dug that match. I thought that was some good business right there. It looks like Lashley's going to be getting into a few with Matt Riddle, which is fine by me, so... Uh, that should be a nice pair up. I gotta say, man, Raw doesn't get its props. It really doesn't. I think they've been putting out better shows in the last two to three months. I I really do. Uh, the matches, the flows of the show. I could do a little bit less without the missed TVs every single week where we're doing the correct every. Uh, I, 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 it got to the point, guys, that I stopped transcribing promos because it just was too much. Of the back and forth with Miz and John Morrison. Like, I get it. That's their thing. Their heels and stuff. But, but like, some of it is just too over the top at times. But, um, no, man. Like, let's talk about the main event. You have Randy Orton versus the Mr. Rogers version of Bray Wyatt. Which I thought was a nice choice there. Um, and it had this really nice visual where we had no contest, basically. But Randy Orton did hit the RKO on Mr. Rogers, but the lights went out. And then the Fiend made Orton pass out to the Mandible Claw. I thought that was just a really dope visual. So I thought overall, in general, for this week in WWE, uh, I thought Raw was a better show than SmackDown. 
and then um, you know I decided it's a nice like solid building block for the matches that we're gonna have at TLC. We already have five announced, and I'm pretty sure we'll get some more updates on that tomorrow night on SmackDown. Well, what's what's gonna happen with Sami Zayn? Who are the Street Profits gonna fight at TLC? Like those are questions that are up in the air and stuff that we need to figure out as the weeks go on. So overall. Not too shabby. Some stuff you can do. Some things you can do without. Par for the course with the WWE, obviously. But, um, um, again, I I think people need to start giving Raw its props. Yes, it shows three hours and it doesn't have the pace or the fluidity as some people would put out there. But I I, 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 I digged it this week. So, all right. That's this week in WWE. When we come back. We'll talk about some stuff outside the WWE bubble before we get to our main event segment, pal, right here on the Hoots Podcast. Back here on the Hoots Podcast, time for your weekly wrestling roundup here on the Hoots Podcast. We're going to be going over some of the cards and some stuff that's going outside the WWE bubble. Talk a little bit about New Japan Pro Wrestling right now. Uh, We got two big shows I want to preview here right now. Um, We got... The finals of the Best in Super Juniors and the World Tag League Tour. Uh, I'm pretty sure somewhere down the road uh, next week or so, I'll probably talk about just my experience covering that tournament and what matches stood out to me so far. But I just wanted to read down the matches, give you predictions, if you will, for the final two matches. But here's the lineup for uh, the show tomorrow morning. We got a six-man tag match where we have Tashi Ishimori, Chase Owens, and Bella Fale taking on Robbie Eagle, Show and Toriano and Chaos. Um, another six man tag. We have the Empire, Will Ospreay, Jeff Cobb, and Great Okan teaming up for the first time against Okada, Tanahashi, and Toa Hanari. Tag team match. Part number tres. Evil and Yujiro with Dick Togo taking out Shingo and Sonata. That should be a good match. Uh, we got a special uh, tag match as well with uh, Tetsu Naito and Bushi taking on Kota Bushi and B Rob's favorite wrestler, <laughs> Master Watto. <laughs> But here's prediction time, pal. Um, starting off here with the finals of the World Tag League, we got Grills and Destiny taking on Finn Juice. Finn Juice has had G.O.D.'s Dumber over the last couple of months. And that's not an understatement. That's just fact. Whether it's um, the tournament or New Japan Strong, these guys just have G.O.D.'s number. And I think the the prospects of Finn Juice against Suzuki Gun is probably more obvious that that's going to happen. But I like going on the limb sometimes, and I think that I think God is going to win the World Tag League for the first time. I really do. It'll be an awesome match, and I'm looking forward to it. But I think God somehow, some way, find a way to beat Finn Juice. And then finally, Hiromu Takahashi against El Desperado. That should be a barnstormer. They, they already had a good match in, in the uh, B, uh, Best of the Super Juniors. Um, I forgot which day it was, but they had a fantastic match. So I'm sure part number two will be fantastic as well. But uh, this, this is the more obvious one to me. I think Hiromu will defeat El Desperado in the uh, finals of the Best of Super Juniors uh, tournament. And then... Um, Let's talk a little, a little quick about the Super J Cup that's taking place this Saturday in California. It's a they're doing the whole tournament in one night. It's a single elimination tournament, obviously, and there's eight competitors. Uh, first off, we have Chris Bay versus Clark Connors. Um, uh, definitely look to see uh, Chris Bay defeat Clark Connors here. ACH against TJP. I'll go with uh, TJP to beat ACH. Uh, Ray Horse against Blake Christian. This one should be a barnstormer. I haven't done a Ray Horse match since his uh, day as El Dragon El, El Dragon Azteca Jr. on Lucha Underground. So I'm looking forward to that. That should be a great match. But um, I'll probably go with Horses one since they, they do the international field. But I would not be surprised if Blake Christian wins that match. And then... El Phantasmo taking on Leo, Leo Rush. Definitely got to go with Leo, man. Um, the vignettes and all the hype going into Leo, it would really suck for him to have all this hype and then him just lose a first round match. All respect to Phantasmo. Fantastic guy. Former Super J Cup winner. Former IWGP uh, Junior Heavyweight Champion. But 
um, Leo's the man, and he's he's here to collect, man. <laughs> he's collecting checks in New Japan. He, he he popped up on MLW last night, which was another good show. You guys should check out MLW as well. And um, yeah, go support Leo. I, I think he's doing some great stuff. If you ask me, guys, I, I think it's really up to two people. I really think it's either um, I think it's either uh, TJP or Leo Rush is going to win the Super J Cup. And I'm going to go with Leo. I think Leo Rush will win the Super J Cup on Saturday. And also there's a special tag match in the show, where, which is Carl Fredericks and Ren Narita. I haven't seen Ren Narita in a while. Uh, they'll be taking on Kenta and Hikaleo. That should be a pretty good match. So I'm looking forward to that. So... Uh, Super J Cup and Best of Super Junior slash World Tag League Finals will be taking place this uh, weekend, and I'll have those articles for you on ProWrestlingTransTruths.com. Also, don't forget, NWA just came back with NWA Shockwave. You guys should support that as well. And then I also wanted to mention, I forgot this from last week, um, Tribute to the Troops, man. One of my favorite shows to cover throughout the year, man. Uh, I love covering that show. It, it, it pays homage to the troops and what they sacrifice their bodies for, for our, our safety. And I, I love what... Um, I, I really love uh, what Tribute for the Troops really stands for, you know. I, I just really like that show. So Let's make some predictions for Impact Final Resolution 2020. Coming up this Saturday as well, the final Impact Wrestling pay per view of the year. Eric Young taking on Rhino. Got to go, with Eric Young. There, Tommy Dreamer versus Larry D. Um, I find, I think Larry D will beat Tommy Dreamer in some shenanigans. Uh, Havoc in the van against Team C Stars. Go Havoc in the van to win that one. Rohit Raju versus somebody to be determined for the Impact. Oh man. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rohit. <laughs> uh, never mind. It's, yeah, Rohit versus somebody to be turned for the exhibition title. I'll figure that out on Saturday. <laughs> Carl Anderson versus Ethan Page. If Ethan Page wins, the Dorf will get another shot at the Impact World Tag Team titles. I think Carl Anderson will defeat Ethan Page. Uh, Deanna Peraza will retain over Rosemary, and I do see Rich Juan retaining over Chris Bay, so. Double duty night for Chris Bay on Saturday night, so get your fill of Chris Bay action, pal. And, yeah, that's pretty much it for uh, this week outside of the WWE bubble, our weekly pro wrestling roundup. And right now, we're going to get to what everybody's been waiting for, the moment of the week that you've been waiting for more than anything, at least when it comes to wrestling podcasts. It is time for what? The hell is wrong with AEW? And we're going to start off with the Brother Carter in 3, 2, 1. It's time for What the Hell is Wrong with AEW? What the hell is wrong with AEW? Okay, well, I will give credit where credit is due. This week's show was better than last week's, but that really isn't saying very much. But let's get into it. Okay, Young Bucks versus Hybrid 2. I knew we were off to a great start with Hybrid 2 when um, they didn't even get a TV entrance. So that's good. And then we get into the match and it's blah, 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 super kick spot, blah, blah, blah. Boring, whatever. We've seen it before. They're great athletes, no doubt about it. But where's the storytelling? This is the big problem with this company, is there's no storytelling. It's just spot, 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 super kick, party, spot, spot, whatever. It's, it, 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 it's the same boring stuff every week. Uh, well, it's not boring. I mean, it's the same stuff every week and we're not getting anything new there's just no storytelling it's just there's there's no pace to the matches it's just spot 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 and that's it it's eventually it gets old and it's it's gotten old already no question okay i cannot figure out this cody sting and darby allen stuff i will admit that i'm intrigued but the best thing that can happen for all of this 
is for Sting to give a rub to Darby Allen because Darby Allen is a guy you can build the company around. You can he's a, he's a homegrown talent. You know, he's a guy that's coming up through the AEW ranks and he's he's great, good promo, good look, very good in the ring. So Sting giving a rub to Darby Allen, I can get behind that. I think that's I think that'd be great. But it looks like we're now going to get Cody versus Sting. Okay, here's the thing about Cody. Cody doesn't have one feud that he's going on. He's now getting himself involved with pretty much three feuds at once. Where it looks like we're going to get Cody versus Sting, Cody versus Team Taz, which actually is what I want to see because they had a great promo a couple weeks ago. So that was great. I want to see that. And now Cody versus Shaq, which is uh, because then Shaq, for some stupid ass reason, was on the program and gave a sit down interview with with Tony Schiavone and Brandy Rhodes, but. Shaq was like calmly trying to promote Jade Cargill or whatever. And that's fine. But Brandy then throws a drink in Shaq's face. And now Shaq's going to get after Brandy. And then which means Cody's going to come to defend his wife. And now so basically Cody has three feuds that are going on at the same time. Like pick one and stick with it, dude. Pick one and stick with it. So I just and now Cody's going to be a heel. He's going to be a face. I can't figure out Cody at all. It's, he just confuses me so much. He can't leave well enough alone. Josh said it before. He wants to be Triple H so bad. But he just, he's not. He's just not. John Silver and Alex Reynolds are funny. I no doubt. I like their segment with their, their comedy bit with Hangman Adam Page. I thought that was fine. But they have completely strayed away from what the Dark Order is. They're supposed to be like these cultish following members to Mr. Brody Lee who's gone MIA. And it's going to be an absolute total train wreck when Brody Lee makes his return. Because Brody Lee's going to come back, what are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. And then the Dark Order is either going to go to their same old boring crap that they had when Brody Lee was, was, was running the show, or they're going to break off and actually be somewhat entertaining. I just can't figure out what the Dark Order is. Um, they should just be some comedy gimmick and drop Brody Lee. Well, Brody Lee should just be dropped all together because he's boring as hell. Um, his his failed experiment in all elite wrestling, well, was a failure. So uh, Dark Order just needs to do the comedy thing. It's actually working for them because I actually think Silver and Reynolds are are quite entertaining. Okay, now we get to the Inner Circle promo and the potential breakup of the Inner Circle. The only person in this promo that I actually cared about and enjoyed was Ortiz. I thought he actually did a really good job. And and I thought his promo part of it was fine. It was, seemed natural. There was a good flow to it. So that was great. But the rest of it was was unnecessary. It was boring. MJF just tried to do his shtick and it, it just it didn't work. MJF needs to get away from the inner circle and be just be this ridiculous chicken heel on his own with Wardlow. I mean, at some point, I think he needs to dump Wardlow, too, and, and, and get some new help, because Wardlow, the, the Wardlow thing has run its course. He needs to do his own thing. But MJF with the Inner Circle makes no sense. The Inner Circle needs to, to just go away. It, 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 I just this, this promo was, it, it was boring, uninteresting, except for Ortiz. He did a good job. I, I will say, I would like to see Sammy versus MJF. I think that could be a good match. But Sammy is just, was, he's just awkward on the mic, too. This wasn't his best work, either. And I like Sammy Guevara, but it just, I, it didn't work for me. It, and, and MJF in the inner circle does not work. I still can't figure out why Lance Archer, with the sadistic, clearly like the original heel, Jake Roberts, is suddenly randomly a babyface all of a sudden. He's just all of a sudden going to team up with uh, Pent Pentagon, I, I can't remember his full name, Pentagon and, and Pentagon Jr. and Ray Phoenix. Um... So I just I just can't figure out why all of a sudden that's happening. Then again, the sadistic he's just with like the sadistic Jake Roberts who helps his team cheat, but they're the faces. Why he's just came back and is randomly a heel? It makes no sense to me. As does much of AEW's booking and storylines make absolute no sense. Lance Archer is just another one of those characters that has come in strong, was fed to their world champion uh, in John Moxley, and now has now fallen off so far. And then the match suddenly ends with no build to the finish, and the heels win. I heard that maybe it was because one of their superstars got hurt, but it's still you can you can you can do better storytelling than that on the fly to get to the end of the match. The 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 the, the match just basically suddenly stopped, and there was no build towards the end of the match. Again, that's AEW's flaw. There's no storytelling. There's no storytelling in this company. They just try to get by on spots, and believe me, that gimmick has run its course. 
Once again, the women's division makes absolutely no sense at all in this company. There's no continuity. So last week we saw Britt Baker, and she was doing something, and it was great, but she wasn't even mentioned on television this week. And now we're getting Abaddon, who was mentioned two weeks ago, to, uh, and now it looks like she'll be doing a program with Karu Shida. And I actually, and I'm going to talk about this uh, when we get to the thoughts of Derrico, but I actually didn't mind um, Abaddon. I think she was fine this week. I actually have, there's promise in her, but there's no continuity in the women's division at all. Like, it's you, you, you can't tell who's going to be on TV, who's not going to be on TV. You can't get invested in the storylines because they don't further them every week. They just, they, 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 have, they have one women's segment for a small amount of time, and it's not the same performers every week. So you can't get invested in the storylines. Then we get to the main event. The, the tr- MJF versus Orange Cassidy. The, they tried to do the bat trick thing, like a la, a la Eddie Guerrero, but they didn't cause a disqualification. So it didn't make any sense. What was the point? And then Miro and Times New Roman font Kip Sabian, who are base, who are useless, come in, get the win against Orange Cassidy to fa- f- um, uh, to further their storyline, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that. But the, the bat trick made no sense. This edition of AEW Dynamite was better, but it still wasn't great. So seriously, what the hell is wrong with AEW? <laughs> This has been What the Hell is Wrong with A-E-W. Hi, thank you, Bert Carter, for the submission this week. Bert, you are the man. Talk about what happened this week in A-E-W. Uh, I got to tell you, man, every time I watch A-E-W, I feel like I'm um, eating meatloaf, or I'm consuming meatloaf. That's just <laughs> the taste I feel whenever I watch this show and this company, man. Um, I gotta tell you, man, um, I think for the most part, I thought this was better than Winter is Coming. I mean, I don't know how you can get worse than Winter is Coming, but hey, I said that before about AEW shows, then they doubled down from shit they did in the past, so hey, there you go. There was a couple things I did like. I liked the, uh, Dustin Rhodes match with Preston Vance, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, and then the interaction with Evil Uno, more importantly, I thought that was really funny. Um, like the FTR match with the uh, Varsity Blondes, I thought that was fine. Uh, I thought the match layout really quick for the the family against Lance Archer, the Lucha Brothers were all over the place. Very sloppy at times, in my opinion. Um, but... Yeah, those were just a couple of brief things I wanted to mention that I did like on Dynamite this week before. Oh, here we go. Here's Josh bashing everything on Dynamite. Uh, you know, it's it's the major things that goes on in these shows that I just don't like about AEW. And, and that's the shame of it. Like, you have your executive vice president, Cody, in three feuds, like Brother Carter's mentioning. And, like, he's having something down the road with Shaq that's going to be a clinic, right? <laughs> and then he's going to have uh, a thing with Team Taz because Taz is still butthurt over what Cody Rhodes said a couple weeks ago. And then he got Cody Rhodes against Sting down the road because that's really going to move the needle. Like... <sighs> Cody is such an egomaniac and just never sees the base yet. Yeah, this guy is still treated as the top baby face, right? Um, yeah, it's, I'm not a Cody Rhodes guy. That he could go, he, he could go home and stay home. As far as I'm concerned, I was having this conversation with the good brother Chris Letta earlier today, and I'm not really in the mood to really yell in this week's segment like I was last week. But you know, you guys know it with me. I keep it 100 here. I'm gonna shoot off the hip. The Inner Circle's Ultimata segment last night on Dynamite was worse than Bailey. This Is Your Life. I don't know what in the blue ever-loving fuck that segment was. It went on and on and on forever. And it went absolutely nowhere. We got this tea. So we have, let's get this right. We had a town hall meeting. We had a meeting at a restaurant that ended up being the dinner devil crap. Now we have the ultimatum, and we still have nothing. This slow burn for a turn on Chris Jericho, that's not going to mean shit. <laughs> Honestly, because the inner circle sucks. They're, they are, 
they are by far the worst faction in wrestling. I'll tell you right now that Retribution is better than the Inner Circle. I'll fight anybody on that right now. Retribution is better than the Inner Circle, and it's not even close. Look, I, 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 I can't even wrap my brain around it, because like, you have MGF and Orange Cassidy as a main event, right, for the Dynamite Diamond Ring. Okay, MGF wins. But again, I just don't get it with this fascination with Tony Khan where every match has to conclude with this post-match melee that's just sloppy and all over the place. Like, you could you could say that's, oh, that's just setting up more uh, layers and stuff into uh, the storylines. No, it's just fucking stupid. You don't need a post-match brawl after every match that you have on TV. That's stupid. Speaking of stupid, okay, we're going to tease this big announcement on Dynamite there. We're going to get this big announcement from the new world champion, Kenny Olivier, right? And then he comes out with Don Callis, and they literally repeat word for word the same thing they had in the interview with Josh Matthews. Now, I, I like I mentioned earlier, I liked what Don Callis did does on the mic and I like where he's coming from with the invisible hand thing. I have no problem with that. But my issue and what I'm gonna talk about this week is Kenny Olivier. And I just can't take him seriously guys. I, I really can't. I want to enjoy his work. I think he does have good matches, but from him as a character and believability and all that stuff that goes into pro wrestling He's the least intimidating top guy I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm just being honest with you guys. I I, I don't buy things. He doesn't scare me. Like, yeah, he has his little stupid douchebag intro. And, like, my ears start playing every time I hear Justin Roberts say, North Carolina! Like, I, it's just a stupid shtick. Nobody cares about the observer. And... Look, I like Doc Cass. He's doing good stuff. But, okay, this differs from Paul Heyman hyping up Brock Lesnar to Doc Cass hyping up Kenny Olivier. Okay? Like, l l let's let's talk about this and let's be serious about this for one second. Like, am I really supposed to believe that Kenny Omega and this whole deal with Impact Wrestling is really going to change the guard of wrestling? Really? Come on, guys. I think we're better than that. Like, it's nice to have wishful thinking that all these companies are going to work with each other. But just you wait. Just you wait down the road once these EVPs start turning on each other. Because just like in the wrestling business, especially when you're in business and you're partners, uh, yeah, you may be friends. But when you're partners in business, sooner or later, there's going to be tension and there's going to be friction. And that's the problem when you have the boys running the asylum and it's a Teflon zone, and it's the Wild Wild West, and we're all uh, patting each other on the ass and telling everybody how great we are, instead of actually trying to form an identity and build an actual wrestling promotion. But we gotta present much shows and book shows that's gonna satisfy fucking the wrestling Twitter bubble. Like, the wrestling Twitter bubble represents the entire wrestling fan base. Like, give me a freaking break. So, yeah, we're, was there progress this week? From last week's Winter's Coming event? Sure. But it still doesn't change the fact that this show sucks. <laughs> Dynamite, to me, is the worst televised show throughout the week. It's not close. And you want to know why? It's run by this guy. Here we go. Following announcement is paid for by All Elite Wrestling, home of AEW Thank you, Mr. Shivani. Hey, Impact Wrestling. It's great to be here tonight via this paid ad that's allowed me to join. I understand the brand new AEW World Champion Kenny Omega is going to be here on this show tonight, so I thought I would join him. If I wanted to stop it, Tony, I absolutely could. Yes, I know that. I could file an injunction. I could tell Kenny he's in breach of contract, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I thought I would actually help fund the show via this ad because I think it's going to help. It's going to help the budget, it's going to help the bottom line, and hopefully it helps promote AEW to have our champion on this show. The only thing I don't like about it is the way Kenny won the belt. It was a joke. It was disgraceful. No, sir. It was terrible. John Moxley, the greatest champion in wrestling, he didn't deserve that. 
But let me tell you something. Don Palace, you're welcome to come with Kenny tomorrow, too. In fact, Kenny, I know how you're arriving at the show. I handled it. I hand, you know, set up your arrival. We're more than happy to accommodate you. We're just really looking forward to seeing you, buddy. Tomorrow night, AEW Dynamite, tune in. We got a real big card with big main events. Like... Fourth Cassidy versus MJF for the Dynamite Diamond, and Lance Archer and the Lucha Brothers versus Eddie Kingston, the Butcher, and the Blade. And I understand they have some tag teams here in the Tag Wrestling Tony. I've heard that. I've heard yeah. they have some. Well, you're going to see the greatest tag team in the world, the World Tag Team Champions of the Young Bucks, taking on Jack Evans and on Elico, TH2, tomorrow night. The Young Bucks are the best. And let me tell you something, Tony. Some of these teams are out here. Maybe I'll come check them out. In fact, I have some investments in Nashville, Tony. Yeah. yeah. There's some rumors that I might even buy Impact Wrestling. You you spent a cup of coffee in Impact Wrestling yourself, didn't you, Tony? Yeah, for one night, and I quit the business for 18 years. 2002. 2002. Well, I'm glad I brought you back, Tony. It was my pleasure. I'm thrilled to have you. I love you, buddy. Thank you, buddy. He's about And let me tell you something. Tomorrow night on Dynamite, you're going to see this guy, Tony Schiavone, talk to Sting. How long has it been since you talked to Sting? Oh, 20, 25 years. Yeah, absolutely. 25? Yeah, that's absolutely. great. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, it's going to be a great time. And, Kenny, I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. I can't wait to see what you have to say tonight. And, Don, like I said, you're welcome to stop by yourself. See you guys tomorrow. My God, <laughs> what are we doing here, guys? <laughs> and you thought Dixie Carter was bad, folks? That's what's wrong with AEW right there. Money Mark Jones. All right, folks, we're gonna wrap this thing up right now. Well, thank you guys so much for checking out episode one hundred. No, not one hundred two hundred. Episode two hundred thirty-five of the Hoots Podcast. All I ask for you guys right now is to. Um, Make sure to subscribe to the podcast right now so you get to you free charge every single Thursday, whether it's Apple Podcasts or anywhere you're your po- podcast from. If you do have Apple Podcasts, please leave us a four or five star review slash rating. It helps expand the reach of the show. Also, make sure to book our trans- uh, pro wrestling transcripts dot com. I uh, also ask for you guys to uh, follow me on Twitter if you'd like at the Who's Podcast. I'm on Instagram, Joshi Lopez94. That's J O S H I E Lopez94. And I also have a music page at Josh Lopez Music if you want to check that out as well. Um, with that being said, I want to say thank all of you for the support. It really means a lot to me, guys. We've reached over 225,000 downloads and listens of the podcast this year. And that's thanks to all you guys, man. It's really been humbling with the support. So we're on the road to episode 250, 15 more to go. And um, thank you for being part of the ride. And this this train ain't stopping anytime soon. So thank you guys for the support. It really means a lot. So, um uh, with that being said, remember, folks, be the authentic product that is yourself, and always remember, you are dictating the life. The, you're dictating the pace of your life. Nobody else. So I'm going to send off to Berta Carter for a brand new edition of the Thoughts of Derrico. This has been episode 235 of the Who's Podcast, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Uh, yes, sir. And now the thoughts of Derrico. Listen well, man. Welcome, welcome, one and all, to the segment that should never be locked inside a cage, but should be released for all the world to see. It is the thoughts of Derrico, featuring the one, the only, Brother Carter. Lots to talk about this week, lots that I want to break down, and I want to start with the War Games pay-per-view that took place this past Sunday, War Games 2020. thought it was an excellent show from top to bottom as... NXT takeovers usually are. First takeover I've had a chance to watch in a while, so it was great to be able to watch it. And I really thoroughly enjoyed the event. Uh, just thought everything about it was just very, very, very well done. Starting off with uh, NXT showing why their women's division, and why I've said their women's division is the best in the world. All, all of the athletes that competed in the women's War Games match were just absolutely terrific. Um, Io Shirai jumping off that cage uh, with a garbage can on her head. That was that was just crazy. That was unbelievable. And um, she, again, the Genius of the Sky uh, moniker is well-deserved. And just a terrific match overall. So I really enjoyed that. Um, Tommaso Ciampa and Timothy Thatcher just had a war, which was 
to be expected. That was absolutely terrific. Uh, Dexter Loomis and the Cameron Grimes and the Strat match was very entertaining. I really enjoyed that. They, they did a great job with that. Johnny Gargano, once again, your new NXT North American champion, thanks to the return of Austin Theory, who I thought had the best line of the night where he said, it's me, Austin, and pointed to himself. It was me all along, pointing to himself, Austin. Thought that was absolutely brilliant. And I absolutely love that. So congratulations to Johnny Gargano. First ever three-time North American champion. That's great. And then, of course, the Undisputed Era defeated Pat McAfee's group for the brand in the War Games match. No surprise. Actually, I was surprised there. I thought that McAfee's team would get the win. But, folks, Pat McAfee is every bit a WWE superstar as anybody in that locker room. And he may be the best heel in professional wrestling right now. Absolutely incredible. They need to sign him to a full-term Long time contract if they haven't already and make him a, a, a WWE superstar. He is terrific in every way, shape or form. He was born to be a professional wrestler and he's finally getting his shot. He takes bumps well. He knows how to work a promo. He wants to learn. He wants to get better. Uh, and I'm all in on Pat McAfee. We know how entertaining he is and what he brings to the table. So congratulations to everybody involved. I'll be curious to see what's next for the Undisputed Era, but Overall, I thought that was absolutely great, and congratulations to everybody involved with NXT War Games. Speaking of NXT, uh, also, Karrion Cross and Scarlett made their return to NXT programming this week. I happened to, happen to catch those videos, and that's awesome. I'm, I'm sure that Karrion Cross and Finn Balor are on course or, or on a collision course for the NXT Championship, and I can't wait to see it. It's going to be a terrific match. And I hope that Karrion Cross finally gets his reign with the NXT Championship that was taken away from him. It's not his fault, just due to injury. But I hope that he'll finally get a chance to have a good, solid run with the title because he is another. He is definitely somebody you can build NXT around, and I think he is absolutely terrific. So some great stuff from NXT this week. I want to go back to SmackDown real quick and talk about that for just a moment. Uh, we've got a TLC ch- a match between Roman Reigns and Kevin Owens coming up at the pay per view. That was great. Um, really good stuff, uh, from the show this week. Some terrific matches. I really enjoyed the, uh, the six person, the six man intercontinental championship match as a tribute to Pat Patterson. I thought that was great. Really, really enjoyed that. Looks like we're going to be getting Carmella and Sasha Banks next week, uh, for, uh, for the, uh, sorry, the title match is going to be, um, at TLC. That's right. Um, but I think they're going to be uh, coming face-to-face probably next week. So that's going to be great. Looking forward to that. That's going to be absolutely terrific. And um, let's see. What else can I talk about? Uh, King Corbin got his revenge uh, with the return of Steve Cutler and Wesley Blake, former known as the Forgotten Sons. And I had actually forgotten. Ah, see what I did there? Forgotten about the Forgotten Sons. So it was cool to see them back. Um, I always thought they were a great team. Uh, unfortunately, they just never got off to the right foot. Um, on the main roster. So I'm glad that they're getting that opportunity. I think they're both terrific. And putting them with King Corbin is a good plan. I like that. And kind of building the King Corbin's kingdom, if you will. So I like that. And it looks like we'll be getting a program with Corbin and Murphy and, and the Mysterio family with the Forgotten Sons. And I think that's going to be, I think that's going to be terrific. And uh, what can you say about Roman Reigns? Just, a, just another tremendous performance by uh, the tribal chief, not only taking out Kevin Owens, but then taking his frustrations out on Jay Uso. So, I'll be curious to see where they go with this. How long it's going to take for, how long it's going to take for Uso to get his revenge and finally turn on, on Reigns. Maybe cost him the title at some point. I don't know what the what the long term storyline is for that, but um, maybe just getting the beating. Eventually, um, Uso will snap. Um, whether it's Naomi or Jimmy Uso or somebody's going to talk him out of it. And eventually we'll get a showdown between him and Reigns, which is a long time coming. I think it's going to be great. But I, Reigns continues to be the best part about WWE. He's the best thing going in professional wrestling right now. And just uh, they call him the tribal chief for a reason. Switching over to Raw, I was hoping that Asuka would get more time with Shayna Baszler. But I know why they didn't. I think we'll be... Um, We'll be getting a, a bigger match with him later on in the future, which I think is fine. I'm, I'm totally cool with that. And um, I also like um, how Lana finally taking some something things into her own hands and really getting after Nia Jax. I thought that was kind of cool. So um, sent you know sent sent Jax through the table, kind of getting some revenge. And so I thought that was kind of cool. We'll be getting a match between the well, <laughs> Lana and Nia Jax go one on one next week, so that should be interesting. But 
so I, and then I hope this leads to more a one a, a longer one on one match with Oscar and Shayna Baszler down the road. Uh, looks like we're we're seeing the end, perhaps of ret- of uh, reckoning and retribution. I I just refuse to co- refuse to call them by their names. I think it's absolutely stupid. Please call her Mia Yim. If, if she gets away from from uh, retribution, just please, for the love of God, call her Mia Yim. And I still think they should call the other members of retribution, Dominic Dijakovic and Shane Thorne and Dio Madden, because that's who they are. I think the group's more effective if you take away those stupid one word names and. Um, and, and, and just call them by who they are. But, so we'll see what happens with that. That, that the, but, uh, again, great match, uh, with Ricochet, Dana Brooke, and, uh, Slapjack. And, um, I'm calling them saying Slapjack now, um, but Slapjack and Reckoning. Uh, let's see. Cedric Alexander continues to prove why him being with the Hurt Business is the best thing that has happened to his career. Thought, uh, just, I love what he's doing with them. I think it's absolutely great. The Hurt Business best faction in professional wrestling right now. They are just firing on all cylinders. AJ Styles, <laughs> his segment with Miz and Morrison was hilarious. I thought it was really great. I really, really liked that. But the thing for me this week, man, how did Bray Wyatt make that uh, character change so quickly? Like, he just, it was almost like as soon as the lights went out, he quickly threw on his mask. He must have quickly taken off his uh, his, his sweater and his pants, I guess probably just his sweater and just threw the mask on, I guess, but golly, he made that switch so fast into the fiend from the Bray Wyatt, Mr. Rogers character and then put Randy Wharton in the mantle claw. That was unbelievable. That was so well done. And I just, Bray Wyatt to me, the second best in the world right now behind Roman Reigns. He's the leader of Raw. Or he, he's the best thing about Raw, and Roman Reigns is the best thing about SmackDown, no doubt about it. So, really solid show from Raw. Really enjoy that. Uh, close with just a few of the positive things I enjoyed from AEW this week. Really hope to see Darby Allen versus Brian Cage. I think that could be a cool match for the TNT Championship. Maybe a cross promotion or kind of a title unification match between that and the FTW Championship. I think that'd be cool. I uh, enjoyed the match with FTR and the Varsity Blondes. I enjoyed that match. Uh, FTR is a great in, in, uh, in-ring talent as far as a tag team. So that was really terrific. <laughs> okay. After the Evil Uno, or after the uh, Dustin Rhodes versus 10 match, I thought that match was kind of lame. But <laughs> Evil Uno made a great point about Dustin Rhodes being the third most valued Rhodes brothers, or the third most important Rhodes family member on on AEW with Dynamite each week, which is completely true behind Cody and Brandy. <laughs> and then asking him to be called seven in the dark order was hilarious. That was very clever uh, as a throwback to his stupid seven gimmick in WCW. So I thought, I actually thought that was pretty clever. So good job with that. Um, not bad to Abaddon uh, this week. I kind of, I can get behind this kind of creepy, creepy gimmick. I can get behind that for sure. Um, I think that there's some potential there with her. Um, but like I said, I, I like the look and the aggressiveness and, and her getting up from the kendo stick shot was kind of cool. I definitely think there's some potential there. But like I said, there's just so much inconsistency in the women's division in AEW. I just, I'm having a hard time getting behind the booking. But, um, that's not, t- not taken away from Abaddon. She did a good job. And I'll close by saying this. I, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I actually didn't mind Kenny Omega this week. I didn't. I thought that he's embracing his total, complete, just douchey role, and he's doing it really well with the sunglasses and the hair in his promo. Think that was kind of cool. I and if he can keep going with his over-the-top, ridiculous entrance, it might work for him. It doesn't absolve him of his sins for the past, but it's moving in the right direction. And I actually didn't mind Kenny Omega if this is where they go with this character. I can get behind it. So we'll see what happens. And those are the thoughts of Derrico for this week, the Hoots podcast airing on December 10th, 2020. Uh, Just for my final thoughts this week, folks, again, just remember as we enter December, the final months of the year, or final month of the year, final weeks of the year, keep wearing your mask, keep hanging in there, folks. We're going to make it. And 2021 is going to be a great, great year. This has been The Thoughts of Derrico. You're smarter now, man.